is to today's webinar entitled, Your Best Defense Against Neck Pain and Headaches. Let me introduce myself to those of you who may not know, know me and tell you my goals for the webinar. I've been working as a practitioner in the bodywork field for the past 46 years. At the beginning as a massage therapist, I studied with Dr. James Syriax from England and received my PhD in sports medicine and a education in the late 1970s. I've written four books in the field. I've written Exercise Without Injury, Listen to Your Pain, Are You Tense, and The Ethics of Touch. I had a co-author on that. I've had a regular column in several massage therapy publications since 1986, and I founded a school called the Muscular Therapy Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1974, and owned it for about 32 years. I travel all around the country teaching orthopedic massage, communication skills, and Aaron Mattis's active isolated stretching and strengthening. Over the past few years, I've also created a series of DVD programs that took hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of hours to do uh, on the assessment and, and treatment of low back pain, neck pain, knee pain, and various common injuries. The goal of this webinar is to talk to you about and teach you a number of techniques to keep your head and neck healthy and pain free. You can also teach these techniques to your clients. Uh, if you can keep a flexible neck, a strong neck, and one that's relaxed, you'll be more likely to stay out of pain, and you'll be also more likely to not have headaches. Neck pain and headaches frequently go together. So here's the structure that we're going to use. We're going to meet for 40 minutes. Uh, I will present material for about 20 minutes, and then answer questions for the last 10 or 15 minutes or so. I will be finished in 35 to 40 minutes, and then I'll suggest that you watch two brief videos after the webinar that are going to go in detail of some of the things that we're going to describe. About questions, anytime you have a question, type it into the question box, and I'll get to as many as I can. And if, you don't, if I don't get to your question, please ask it to me on my Facebook page uh, after the webinar if you're a member of Facebook, which is a good idea. It keeps you better in touch with people. And if you don't have a pencil and paper, you probably want to get one, so you might want to take some, some notes. So why is the neck so vulnerable to pain? 50 million people, at least, suffer from headaches in the United States. Another 40 million from neck pain. Now that means there are 90 million people. That's about one out of three people in the United States that could use your help. Head and neck pain can be caused by many different factors. You know, it could be a concussion, chronic stress, it could be neck ligament injuries, heredity factors, it could be sleeping with your neck in an awkward position. Ask around and most people you know have had some neck pain uh, some of the time or, or headaches. And sometimes people think they're normal to have headaches, but normal is not uh, every week or every day. If you take neck pain and headaches together, about one in every three people uh, suffers from them. If there is an injury in the neck, one important principle is that you want to heal in the presence of a full range of motion. Now, why is healing more effective and complete in the presence of a full range of motion? Well, it allows healing to occur with a minimum of adhesive scar tissue, which is really the root cause of a lot of neck pain. Healing in the presence of a full range of motion is a basic essential principle in orthopedic massage. When healing occurs without a full range of motion, adhesive scar tissue forms in inappropriate places, often turning a temporary injury into a chronic one. Internal and external scarring help to perpetuate stubborn injuries and the resulting pain that comes after. People restrict their movement and activities for months or years because they know if they look up too high or they look too long, their neck will hurt or if they bend from the waist to, to lift a pencil off the floor, their back will hurt. Or if they kneel down on their bad knee, uh, they're going to suffer for many, many weeks uh, with pain in their knee. Now, when we heal in the presence of a full range of motion, damaged tissue is replaced by a small but appropriate amount of scar tissue in a discrete and defined area within the original uh, injured structure. There's no strain on the internal fibers due to adhesions, smooth, it really works well. There are no external adhesions, which are adhesions to external structures that pull and hurt. 
and the surrounding muscles and other structures maintain their strength and their flexibility. The three most common causes of head and neck pain are injuries to neck ligaments, the loss of range of motion in the neck, and three, chronic accumulation of muscle tension in the muscles of the face, the jaw, and neck, especially in the occipital region. So let's take them uh, now one at a time. Injuries to ligaments in the neck, a big, big cause of pain in the neck. There are 18 ligaments in the neck that cause untold pain. We have a set of ligaments that hold the spinous processes together. That's these here. And they're called the supraspinous ligaments, shown here on the left on the screen. They're also intertwined with the uh, nuchal ligament, which is uh, contiguous with the supraspinous ligament. And we have a set of ligaments on the other side of each neck, on either side of the neck, called the intertransverse ligaments, shown on the slide on the right. The ones that are uh, on the right and left are the intertransverse ligaments, and the one in the center is the same one, the central line of the spine, as in the picture on the left. Now, these ligaments refer pain to the entire upper body. Besides causing pain directly in the neck, the lower cervical ligaments refer pain to the shoulders, upper back, chest, arms, and hands. And the upper cervical ligaments from C3 up to C1 cause pain in the face, head, and the occipital area in addition to neck pain. When pain is referred to the head from the neck, it is often interpreted as a headache rather than a neck injury causing head pain, which it actually is. It's important for you to be able to tell the difference in order to know how to treat each one. The ligaments might get injured slowly by poor body alignment or body use, or suddenly by getting traumatized in an accident like, like a whiplash. In either case, adhesive scar tissue develops and pain results. Here are some of the areas of the head and the arm that experience pain as a result of ligament injuries to the cervical ligaments. The drawing on the left is from injury to the upper cervical ligaments, C1, C2, C3. You can see the different areas that would feel like a headache. On the right, there are referred pain patterns from the lower ligaments, C5, 6, and 7, and they refer in various patterns that go onto the back of the arm, the front of the arm, the fingers, the thumb, etc. And by knowing which place it is, you have a good sense of which ligament uh, is involved. Now let's look at the second one, range of motion, the loss of range of motion. The loss of range of motion in the neck makes us very vulnerable to head and neck injuries because we forget that we've lost that range and attempt to do things our bodies can't do or don't like to do. We look down while reading for hours at a time, for example. We suddenly turn our head to, to look at something. Uh, or we sleep in a hotel on an oversized pillow or uh, an undersized, undersized pillow, and, and our, we wake up and we can't move our head. These activities then cause strain in the muscles, tendons, fascia, ligaments, joints in the neck because we've moved out of our comfort range of motion, and that's usually been continuing to decrease. So we have a diminishing range of motion as we age unless we do something to prevent it and therefore, if we get into a position that takes us out of that limited range that we've established, we hurt ourselves. There are things we can do to restore range of motion, or which we're going to go into in a few minutes. Unless we keep restricting our motion and our life uh, without doing those kinds of things, we end up in pain. Now let's uh, take a look at the cumulative muscle tension. The accumulation of chronic muscle tension in the muscles of the face, the jaw, the neck, and the occipital region cause stress in the entire head region and are the source of most tension headaches and some other types of headaches as well. Millions and millions of people suffer from stress-induced headaches that are classified as TH, tension headaches. Massage therapy is very effective in helping people with these types of headaches. If we can bring them to a new level of relaxation in the head, face, jaw, and neck, their headaches will be less frequent and less intense if they do occur. A normal number of headaches in a year 
is, let's say, you know, three or four headaches. You know, we all get under enormous stress. That's normal. Any more than that, there's a problem. I remember I had a, a woman that I saw who had a shoulder injury, and I said, well, are there any other difficulties that you have? Well, nothing much. Just I get some headaches. a little bit of headaches, a few headaches. I said, well, how many headaches do you get? And she said, well, um, I get maybe two or three a week. That's all. So I said to myself, two or three a week? So this woman has accommodated herself to living in this way and, and sort of turned it into normalcy, which is, which is good because then she doesn't feel bad that she's got these headaches. So I said, well, would you like, would you like me to you know, take a look at your headaches and treat them along with the shoulder problem that we found? It won't cost you anything extra. Um, you know, if you're interested, I can, I can take a look. She said, oh, yeah, sure. And, and so her shoulder injury uh, led to her having no more headaches. Uh, after you know, a couple of months of treatment. So she was pretty happy. So before we look at the solutions or remedial action, let's first talk about identifying the real underlying problem through an assessment process from all three. The pain may have one, two, or all three issues to deal with that we just mentioned, the range of motion, the injury, etc. It's not unusual to have a neck ligament injury and diminishing range of motion, and accumulated chronic muscle tension in the head and neck altogether in one person. That's not very unusual. To assess your own neck, uh, try these tests on yourself right now. Uh, first, and you might have to put your phone down for a second, but let me describe it first. First, turn your head to one side, and if it doesn't hurt, place your hands at the front and back of your head, as I'm doing there in that slide. That's me. Uh, so that you can gently rotate your head passively as far as it will go. Now stop immediately if there is any pain or any discomfort, and then we know you've got some ligament problems in your neck. If that movement causes pain, some tissue is, is injured. It could be your ligaments. It could be another. It could be a muscle. It could be something else. But most likely it will be your ligaments. When you do that rotation, you should have no pain whatsoever. Zero. Second test. Try this one. Reach over the top of your head. Don't lean to the side. Just lean, reach over the top of your head and pull your head very gently down to the side. And what, what would be normal to feel is a pleasant stretch. If you feel pain on the side you're stretching or on the opposite side, stop immediately if there's pain or discomfort. And that's what we would call another positive sign that there's some problem that's existing there. Then take two fingers. First, put your, your head down very gently, and put two fingers at the back of your head, just above the occipital protuberance, and just press gently if you do not have pain. Only if you do not have pain. If you have pain, the test is over, it's positive. And you put your hand, your two fingers on the back of your head, and if it doesn't cause any pain, then just press down just a little bit, very, very, very gently. And your chin really should go to your chest, or maybe an inch away at the most. So now we're going to go the opposite way, and we're going to have you look up at the ceiling, and again, only using two fingers, press your head gently into extension and see if that causes any pain or discomfort. And if it causes pain or discomfort just looking up, then uh, stop, don't even do the pressure. You'll notice that when you ask a client to look up, oftentimes they just look up with their eyes because they know the neck's going to hurt, and it's unconscious. They don't really know they're not looking up with their head. So if any of these passive tests cause pain. There's some injury and probably some adhesive scar tissue formation uh, in your own neck. So if there is any pain on these tests, there's usually outside intervention is usually needed. Self-treatment is difficult, so I'm not going to spend much time discussing that. Uh, a therapist would require extensive training in, either in person, uh, in a training workshop setting, or use, having a detailed study of uh, deep a DVD program to learn these techniques. I've been impressed by how well therapists have learned by watching my DVDs uh, and studying it on their own. And sometimes I give them like a private a lesson tutorial session after they've done the DVDs, and they, they get it pretty well uh, for doing it at home on their own. Myofascial work can be learned in many, many places. Uh, don't need to learn from me. You can learn from lots of places. Um, the, fi the friction therapy is a cross-fiber massage done without any lubricants. It breaks apart pain-causing uh, adhesive scar tissue. And I would, if you know how to do myofascial work, I usually do that first. 
and then I would go in the covering of the myofascial fibers over the ligaments, they may be affected, and then I would go into the ligaments themselves to learn how to perform the friction therapy. You know, you can take courses, and you can also uh, study the DVD programs. So now let's move on to assessing neck flexibility. Doing a neck flexibility assessment is fairly easy to do. Uh, we move in the six primary directions that the head and neck travel, as we just did with passive assistance. Now we're going to do it just straight out. So first, just rotate your head to the right and left. You should have between 75 and 90 degrees of rotation. And if you don't, then you could probably use some of the stretching exercises that I'm going to tell you about and the video I'm going to show you later. Uh, to, to get the range of motion increased in your neck. My range of motion has increased incredibly uh, since I've been doing these exercises. Then we go to the next one, and that's side flexion. You notice that this woman, that her side flexion to the, on the picture on the left, is that's her side flexion to the right shoulder, is a little greater and better than the side flexion in the opposite direction. So it could be even, it could be not even. And you should have about 45 degrees of motion if you have a normal you know, range of motion in side flexion. And in order to accurately see it, you might want to look in the mirror later on and do this on yourself. Uh, your chin should touch your chest. Touch your chest, as I said, in active flexion. Here she's got a little bit of limitation. Um, and a full range of motion would be chin touching the chest. And then the person, you would look up at the ceiling, and the face should be flat to the ceiling. That's about 50 to 60 degrees of motion in the cervical spine. But if your face is not flat to the ceiling, you've got some limitation. So if these motions are limited, uh, the best solution that I found is the stretches developed by Aaron Mattis, the Active Isolated Stretching, often abbreviated AIS. And this we can do on ourselves, and we can do on our clients. And we'll get to that in a little while. So if you're not at optimum you know, flexibility of your neck, I'll show you uh, how you might change that with these stretches in a couple minutes and with the video that you can watch on uh, YouTube. First, let's finish the neck assessment process uh, to see the level of tension in the neck and how you might think about that. The key to tension in the neck is usually what happens in the occipital region. It can be in the sternocleidomastoid muscles. But generally speaking, it's in the occipital. I found that both the occipital muscles uh, up on the skull, about a uh, half inch above the occipital line, and the deep suboccipital muscles that are the, are the barometers for the health of the neck. And these are inserted under the neck, uh, just under the occipit, with all those uh, rectus spinae muscles, the splenius capitis surfaces, all those muscles that are up there. And whenever we're stressed, most people tighten these muscles. If you just try an experiment for a moment and grip your teeth together, just grip your teeth together for a moment. Just keep gripping them together. And just close your eyes for a minute and just feel what's happening in the back of your neck around the deep part of your occipit right behind your ears. Now, if you're sensitive to it, you're going to feel a gripping in your neck just from bringing your teeth together. And lots of people do that at night because they're working out their tensions of the day. And they wake up in a head stiff, the neck stiff, because they've been gripping their teeth all night. And sometimes people do it in the day. So any stress or stressful event will increase the level of chronic tension in the neck and the occipital region. So to test the level of tension of the occipit, take your knuckle, your index finger knuckle, and place it at the occipit, at the base of the occipit. And press with a good deal of force, first gently at first, and then with a lot of force. You should be able to exert 50 pounds of force in this region and feel great. It should feel like absolutely nothing. Now, if you do this on yourself or anybody else and you do five or six pounds, or this morning I saw a new client, I did like a half a pound of pressure, and she thought I had my elbow in her neck or my knuckle, and it was just the tip of my finger. And then I used my pinky to just show her that this wasn't a lot of force because she could barely believe it. So you can also move your, your knuckle around and do it more laterally, more medially, a little higher on the, uh, the other occipitalis muscle, go closer to the ear where the mastoid process is, or maybe a half inch a lateral to the center of your spine where the occipital protuberance is. So then you'll see, if you can't press very hard, or if you press 
with some amount of force on a client and it's very painful, this means that these muscles, if you see here the occipitalis muscle up on the skull, about a half inch above the occipital line, and underneath you have the sub suboccipital muscles going all the way across the neck. And these, these can be ruthlessly tight and can create all sorts of neck pain and headaches. So now let's look at some remedial action for each of these three issues. So first, regular massage therapy is one method that I highly recommend. And I think every person on the earth should have at least one massage therapy session a week. So that would be really great. And the thing that I've noticed many years, uh, over many years, owning a school, knowing many therapists, training many therapists, coaching many therapists, is that most massage therapists don't get much massage. They're always busy taking care of other people. And it's a really good idea to walk the talk rather than just talk the talk. That if you're going to teach people how to take care of their bodies, really good idea to take care of your own body and get massage regularly, whether you have the time to do an exchange with somebody or you just pay for it. Uh, that's, uh, I've done both, and it's a good idea to do that. So the second thing is the neck relaxer device. Uh, over 40 years ago, I was working with a psychiatrist who worked with the body, and together we worked on this device, and uh, I took it over and developed this neck relaxer, or some people call it the Benz block. And the clients like it because it empowers them to reduce their own level of tension by themselves. What it does is momentarily increase the level of tension very slightly. Uh, this then sends a message to the brain that there's too much tension and causes those muscles to relax. Now, in this particular person, uh, it could, she's balancing it on her occiput. Sometimes people have to hold it with one hand or two hands, doesn't matter. They're on a flat surface, on a bed, on a rug, on a floor, doesn't matter. The person lies first on the rounded edge. It's very rounded, and they think it's like a razor when they're very tense. And they do this for a maximum of five minutes a day, and they do it uh, for several weeks that way. Then they're going to do the semi-round edge. It's a little more sharp. And they do it in various levels, uh, maybe four or five different levels within about an inch space. Uh, and this exerts much more pressure. And then finally, there's a sharp edge, which feels absolutely great when your neck is really relaxed and feels totally horrible when it isn't. Uh, as a matter of fact, people have to use a towel over the, the soft, round edge sometimes uh, to get started. And if that's painful, well, the client is not ready for it yet, I wouldn't give it to them yet, or yourself. You know, if it's uncomfortable, they know they have a lot of work to do. So it's sort of a barometer of where you are. So when, when edge one doesn't cause any discomfort, even in the beginning, they move on to the next edge, or which is more challenging, et cetera. Now, thousands and thousands of people all over the country have been using this device uh, for the past 35 years or so with great benefit. It takes a few minutes to learn how to use it properly. So I've actually put, on a, put a video on YouTube for you or any, anyone to view after the webinar. So now let me uh, teach you some of the active isolated stretching neck stretches to help maintain or increase your range of motion. And I'm going to teach you five. I'm going to teach you flexion, side flexion, flexion at 45 degrees, oblique flexion, and rotation. There are many more. Uh, but uh, for the purposes of this webinar, I think these are the easiest ones to learn without somebody present to help you. So the first one, uh, there are a couple of principles I want to talk about first before we get to showing them to you. Here we're going to stretch the neck in flexion. But first of all, it's active. The person, you're not pulling your head forward. You actually move your head down toward your chest. You, wor you work your body. You work your muscles. And the principle underlying that is that when you are actively moving one set of muscles, in this case the neck set of muscles in the front of your neck, you're relaxing the muscles in the back of your neck so that it helps you to stretch by doing that. The second principle is that you, ho you don't hold the stretch. You keep moving. And you only move for two seconds into the stretch beyond where you can do on your own. So you take your head down as far as you can go, and then you use your hands to assist you to go a little bit further. The third principle is that you're breathing all the time. And when you stretch, you breathe out. And when you recover and come back up, you breathe in. So flexion actively you know, moves you head, your head down, increases the circulation, encourages the opposing muscle to relax, and then you put a mild pressure 
so that the stretch reflex doesn't kick in. What happens is if you stretch longer than two seconds with some aggression, you know, because we're pushing it a little bit here, if you stretch longer than two seconds, the straight stretch reflex comes in and contracts the muscle that you're trying to stretch. Not a good idea. And be sure to remember to exhale as you stretch and inhale when you come up. And do it about six to ten times. And one way I count my two seconds is instead of doing one, one thousand, two, which I think is a little cumbersome, I usually just say one, two, three. So maybe try it right now. Bend your head forward, put your hands on the back of your head, and count one, two, three. OK, so let's go on to the next one. The next one here is flexion at 45 degrees. So you're turning your head slightly to the side, and so that your chin comes to the center of that side of your chest. And you just go down with your muscles, and then you give a slight pressure with your hand so that you stretch a little further for a count of three or two seconds. Then you put your ear toward, you turn your head away from where you're going to stretch, and you bring your ear down toward the center of that side of your chest. And that's uh, an oblique stretch, getting uh, a lot of different uh, structures in the muscles and the ligaments, and building strength in the ligaments and stretching the muscles. And then you do the same thing, side flexion putting a hand over, and you go to the side. And then you just exert some pressure. And the final one is you just rotate your head with your muscles, and then you just take it and rotate it just a little teeny bit further. OK, enough of me talking. Uh, why don't we get to some of your questions? So let me introduce Amy. Uh, Amy, if you could come on. And Amy is my trusted, valued partner in crime here. And uh, so if you have some questions for me, uh, let me know. And we just have a couple of questions now so people can start typing in any questions they have as well. Uh, we have a, a quick question. Is a still point device comparable to a Benz block? Still point device is quite different. It's rounded and uh, sort of gentle and really works on the craniosacral rhythm. This does not do that at all. It's a completely different animal. And this, what it's doing is really putting pressure like you would like, like a shiatsu point, like pressing into a muscle until it releases. And we do it for a particular period of time, 20 to 30 seconds, and the body usually relaxes. And after a person uses this for a while, the neck, that neck relaxer device doesn't hurt them at all. Uh, the ball is there for a very different uh, reason. So let me, I see another question here. What's the difference between internal scar tissue and external scar tissue that you mentioned? Um, okay. Internal scar tissue, if you think of, um, let's say, a guitar, and that's a tendon. The gar guitar strings are in one tendon, or a ligament, or a muscle. And if you tear the guitar string in half, and you put it back together with the scar tissue, so the ends of it come together, that's a good healing. If the, scar, if the actual um, strings of the guitar stick together sideways, every time you go to play or tighten the strings, they're going to pop apart. So that's the internal scar tissue is inside the, the tendon itself or inside the muscle itself. An external scar means that, for instance, you have tendons that kind of rub over bo ends of bones or ligaments in your ankle that rub over bones. And so if you get a big inflammation, you stop moving, and it adheres to the bone, that's not a great, uh, great thing to happen. And then you get an external scar. I hope that answers you. You got another question for me on your side there? Yes. Um, we have a question on migraines. Um, one participant says uh, she suffers from severe migraines frequently, sometimes two a week, and then sometimes goes for months without one and wonders what she can do. Well, this, uh, there's two couple things you can do. One, I would do those neck stretches that are, on the, uh, that are going to be on YouTube right afterwards and do them every day. I'd also see if you could find, wherever you live, find somebody who does active isolated stretching and uh, have somebody really do your neck thoroughly and teach you to do all the stretches. Next thing I'd do is I'd get one of those uh, neck relaxer blocks, and I'd use it every day. And one of the neat things about it is after you use it for a month or six weeks or so, it doesn't hurt at all. You just keep it by your bed. And once or twice a week, you just stick it under your neck on the sharpest edge. And if you notice that it hurts, it means that you're maybe two days before you're going to get a really bad headache. So if you keep your neck relaxed, and if that device does not hurt you at all, then you know that you're going to not be getting a headache pretty soon. Now, if there are other causes, like hormonal things or other things, it's not going to affect that. But usually there are multiple causes of a headache. 
and muscle tension in the occipital region is a huge one. So if you get that beat, then that would be terrific. And of course, get yourself some massages regularly. That would be, would be good. Have somebody work on your head, your neck, your face, um, and that, that would be really good. There's another uh, exercise for migraines with the eyes with a pen-like flashlight that I teach in my headache workshops um, that you can get um, in my RU Tense book uh, that you can get on my website. OK, what else? Amy. Um, yeah, we have a number of other questions. Uh, there's one quick one about the Ben's block again. They're wondering if there are directions that come with the block, and and there are. Is that right, Ben? Yes, there are, there are directions. It's a little thing. It opens up to be this huge thing, and it tells them all about how to do it. And we also have that on the website. Right, and they, they can just have their client watch it, and it'll teach it to them. Right. Um, we had a request for you to post uh, to repost the slide of referred pain patterns in the neck. Are you able to go back there? Okay, let's see. Let's, so we can see that again? Let's see. How do I do that? Let's see. If I do this, uh, go to slide. All right, and let's see. Now, which the pain patterns are? Where were they? Look at an injury referred pain patterns. Here we go. Okay, how about that? Is that the one you mean? Uh, that's one of them. And let me see, there was another one. And there's the next one. Yeah, that's another one. Okay, I'm going to go back to this one. Stay there for a moment. Those are, you know, you can have pain to your teeth, to your jaw, to the nape of, nape of, your, nape of your neck, to your deltoid, to your chest. Different ligaments uh, refer pain to all sorts of places. And then this one over here shows where the headaches are from different ligament injuries. Uh, and this is when pain goes down the arm. And somebody else asked a question about referred pain. If there's a benefit to working on the areas of referred pain, the place where it actually hurts, and is that painful area going to be tight as well? Uh, well, it might be. Um, let's see. If you have a pain, for instance, in your shoulder blade that's coming from a ligament in your neck, because pain at the scapula, medial border of the scapula, comes from a ligament in the neck most often, and you're hurting down in the middle of your neck, not up in the middle of your mid-back there, you know, with the lower scapula, you're not hurting in the neck. So what happens is you accumulate trigger points there. And yes, you can work on those. But if you don't get rid of the cause, which is usually in the ligament, or wherever the cause is, uh, then the, those trigger points are going to return. So I would get at the root cause of the problem, whatever that is. And most of the time, in my experience, it's ligamentous damage and scar tissue. If you get rid of that, you'll notice that all those trigger areas and other tension spots just disappear. And when I was working this morning on somebody in a great deal of pain, when I touched her uh, ligament that was causing the pain in the scapula, there were three actual ligaments doing the same thing. She just felt intense burning with my finger barely touching the ligament. So I knew, and she knew. She was, you know, she said, wow, when you touch up there, it hurts way down there. Amazing. So that's uh, the best way to go is address both. How, another question I see is how important is neck strength? Well, neck strength is really important uh, to, to maintain the health of your neck. Um, now, you don't want to use strength to hold your head up but you have to do things with your head sometimes uh, that require strength. And so having just a little bit more strength in your neck uh, is good. And I find that most people are very weak in the neck. For instance, if I have people lie on the table, one of Aaron Mattis' exercises is you slowly lift your chin off the table and put your chin toward your chest. And you do that in a slow count of three. And you go in a slow count of five down. And most people can't do but three or four of those without getting really tired. And uh, so I give people a lot of neck strengthening exercises. More questions, Ben? Yeah. Great. OK. Uh, what is the average timetable for treatment of a moderate ligament strain? I would say that if it's been recent, pretty recent, let's say it's been in the past couple of months, I would say anywhere from two or three treatments to six or eight treatments. I tell people six or eight treatments. And if they're better in two, they're ecstatic. But if I tell them two and then they take six or eight, they're, they're not happy. And if you have one that's been around for a long time, you know, it could take anywhere from three to four or five months, and even longer, because you've got 18 different ligaments, at least, that could be injured in the neck. And uh, if you just got one, that's one thing. If you've got all 18, I saw a woman I saw this morning had 12 ligaments injured. That's a lot of treatment to get. So it's going to take you know, many moons, many months. And if the client's really good about doing their exercises, relaxing their own neck, increasing the range of motion, well, it's going to take a lot shorter. OK, a uh, quick one on a reference. Uh, uh, if you could re have a reference for a good starter Syriac book. OK, let's see. Well, 
um, he's got a, a pictorial book, which is very good. He's also got a, the textbook of orthopedic medicine, volume two, describes all the techniques. And that book is pretty easy to, to understand. The textbook of orthopedic medicine, volume one, is very complex. And before you take that, I would look, my, look at my listen to your pain. Listen to your pain is 20 bucks, and that one's probably about 100. So, uh, and I, what I did was I took Syriac's work, and I really boiled it down to very simple language and made it so that anybody can understand it very easily. So I'd start with actually with listen to your pain. So we're at the 40-minute mark here. OK, so right after this webinar, I'm going to suggest that you go right to the, uh, the URLs that I'm giving you. And you might write down HTTP colon forward slash forward slash snurl, S-N-U-R-L dot com. And that's always the beginning of these things. And it, I, when you do that, it doesn't have a billion letters in it and numbers, and you can just make something that makes sense. So the whole beginning will be the same for all of the videos. And then you put forward slash neck relaxer. And that gives the instructions for using the block that you can use, your clients can use, your friends can use forever. We're just going to leave it there. And then uh, the next one is the same beginning, HTTP colon forward slash neural.com, and then put forward slash neck stretches. And I'll take you through about eight or nine minutes of neck stretches. Actually, Amy will take you through. Uh, she's going to be doing them, and I'll be uh, talking and uh, helping you to do it. So bye-bye.